578, How to Design Learning Spaces in Libraries. The 10-Minute Teacher Podcast with Vicki Davis. Every weekday, you'll learn powerful, practical ways to be a more remarkable teacher today. So I'm so excited about our conversation today. Karma Scardino, media specialist at my school. This is for you because you just asked me about learning space design. And we have one of the experts with us, Carolyn Foote, who is a techno librarian. She actually received an AASL Library Collaboration Award in 2019. And her blog is The Not So Distant Future. Carolyn, when someone's looking at space, what, where do we start when we talk about learning space design? Well, I think the, and thank you for having me. I think the first place to start is by figuring out what you want to accomplish for students. A lot of times we start with the furniture and we really need to start with our mission and goals and how it impacts student learning, even in the library. And so usually I suggest that people do surveys of their student body ask questions about how they learn, what things about the library interest them, how they learn in general, where they like to study, where they like to read, where they like to work on the computer, and then also ask the faculty those same kinds of questions so that when you're starting to think about a space, you're being inclusive of people's needs. So let me ask you this. What if they don't know what's possible? I mean, so many people have seen libraries and they just think that I have to sit in a a regular up and down chair at a regular table and they don't know that so much more is possible. Is there still room past the survey to say, hey, let's dream? Yes. And definitely that's why I suggest in surveys and David Jakes taught me this as well to think about asking questions that are very open ended, like where do you like to learn? What's the place you feel more, most comfortable when you're learning or thinking or studying so that, you know, so you're asking broad questions so they aren't kind of held up by their picture of a library. But then I think that another clever way to do this that I learned from Edgetopia was doing like a vision design board. And we did one actually physically in our library with those trifold boards. And then you can put photographs on them of way out things like robot or 3D printers or a chair or a slide or, you know, anything you want. And then you give students colored dots or sticky notes, but they only get three. And then they put them by the things that appeal to them. And so you get a sense of what things are attractive or interesting to students that are maybe, you know, not about, again, not so much about furniture, but more about programs or ideas. But you can do it very open-ended, too. You can have pictures of traditional-looking things and modern-looking things or nature and not nature. So you're just trying to get a feel for their tastes, their interests, And then I think really going back to the, because they aren't going to know, I've had some librarians in my district do an activity where they have students design the library of the future, like, you know, 20 years out, what could you do? And the students will say things like, we have robots that shelve the books and we have like a slide. And, you know, if you have some, some activity that asks them to really think beyond, I think that's very helpful strategy as well. But then I also think it's important to look at your district mission and goals and think about where do those align with what libraries are all about. We're really all about connecting people with people, connecting people with ideas, and connecting people with things that contain ideas or things that help them generate ideas, whether those things be books, computers, you know, 3D printers, other humans. So we're really about connections. So thinking about what our overall mission for the space is. Oh, that's fantastic. So you're really starting with some information, gathering some conversations, some surveys, some research. How long does this vision casting time typically last when you're looking at either renovating or creating a learning space? Well, hopefully you have a few months to do it. Now, that's not always the case. Sometimes you have you know, someone, people come to you and you ha- they have money and you've got two weeks. But 
often you have enough time to do some planning. Mm -hmm. So definitely a period of a couple of months or longer, um, because part of the planning is also creating an idea book or a Pinterest page now, pulling ideas yourself from things that you think meet those goals and what students were saying, what teachers are saying. And um, maybe you want to go look at other library spaces or even like a think tank space in your town or an art museum or a children's museum. So you want to curate a lot of ideas for yourself. So you do need to allow ample time for that whole process to happen. You may want to put together an advisory committee with stakeholders in a district or in the school. So the more lead time you can take, the better, obviously, but at least two or three months so you can gather all this and and make something of it and, you know, make it into something that makes sense for you. Well, and isn't it also about helping everybody get on board? Because, you know, I found that change that people are part of tends to be a lot more positively received than change that is forced on people. That's exactly right. And that's why I think getting student input, teacher input, or even having, like I said, an advisory committee or some sort of uh, library, you know, rethink the library group that comes together periodically and talks and looks at all the data really helps people feel committed to the whole process. Sometimes it involves rebranding, you know, entirely. So you may have curriculum people involved from the district or your principal, or sometimes that depends on how large your district is, whether it would be your principal or people curriculum office if you're in a smaller district, but just having people involved and helping you think about how are you going to rebrand? Because what happens is when you start rethinking your space, if you're really wanting to turn things over a little bit and and tump over some traditions and look at making things new, that may affect policies you have. It may affect your programs. It may affect, you know, how you work with teachers. It's really good to have more people involved so that how depends on how extensive what you're doing is, but people get on board, people get excited about it in your community. So I've got one big question and I just always have to ask this because, you know, for a while everybody talked about learning commons. Now, you know, it's learning spaces. Library, that term is not used quite as much. Media centers not used quite as much. Is there one term that progressive um, media specialists kind of use now for their spaces? Is it just called learning spaces now or what? I think learning commons is still being used. We call our library the research center. I think every broadened out that so many people are coming up with different titles for the space. A lot of them rotate around a learning commons concept, though, where you're trying to bring together, ideally, you're designing a school, you could bring together the counselors and the tech team and all these people sort of surrounding the library. So everybody's kind of working together. So what are some of the names you've heard? I've heard Library Incubator, Library Technology Center. I've heard Garza's Research Center. I still hear Library Media Center a lot. I hear Learning Commons. And then you get cute names, the nook or the book nook or the treehouse or, you know, names that people have come up with at their particular location that they've rebranded. Sometimes people have students vote on the name for the space. We did that within our library. So some of our spaces like our tech help area and cafe area where students can eat is the juice bar, but it's because of electrical juices as well as they can bring food in there. You know, that was student voted on. The students came up with that. So what are the names of all the spaces in your library? We have brainstorming room slash computer lab areas are called the Bat Cave and the Shrieking Shack. So from Harry Potter and from Batman, students voted on both of those. We have the Story Bar and we have the Juice Bar. So the Story Bar is where you have the uh, books? There's an area where books are genrefied because we haven't genrefied our whole library. So we did that for our ninth graders because the middle school is genrefied. So we have a small area of genrefied titles. So that's where they are. Yeah, so we have different areas. The students voted on all of those. Well, you're such a great resource, and I know that uh, media specialists and librarians would love to read your blog, The Not So Distant Future. Carolyn, this is such an exciting topic, and just re-envisioning what your learning area can be that has books and so many other things. Thanks, Carolyn. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And we've definitely gotten some visionary topics 
for discussing what's going on in your library or your media center. What types of things do you want to see happening there? Should you change the name? But remember, if you just change the name and you don't change how a space is used, then it's just window dressing. We actually want kids to be researching and learning and sometimes even making in our common media spaces. So have those conversations and discuss if you need to recraft the vision for your media center or your library. 